Hello and behind me is a Douglas DC-3, an icon of aviation. This aircraft has an incredibly interesting history. In fact, it only exists because of an argument between Boeing and TWA. So in this video, I'm going to take you on a tour of this aircraft uh, and point out what makes it such an interesting aircraft. I make videos about planes. If you're into trip reports and tours around interesting aircraft at airports, air shows and museums around the world, make sure you check out my channel and subscribe. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. I'll begin with some footage of the DC-3's military cousin, the C-47, which was also known as the Dakota, Gooniburg and the Skytrain. So the Boeing 247, which first flew in 1933, was considered to be the first airliner as it introduced many new design features. It was fast, had low set wings and was stable in flight. United Airlines did a deal with Boeing to buy all of them for the first few years of production, so understandably, TWA weren't happy with this. They went to Douglas and asked if they could build something bigger and better. The twin-engine DC-1 was pitched to TWA, but the airline really wanted three engines as a safety precaution in case one failed. But Douglas were insistent that only two were needed as it could still fly on one of them and the airline relented. They upgraded the design with the DC-2 and then finally the larger DC-3 that you see in front of you. The main reason it was enlarged was because American Airlines wanted to have sleeper berths inside, although these weren't popular and it reverted to traditional seating. Let's begin by talking about the wings. It came with what they called fillets, which were these smooth connections between the fuselage and wings. These decreased drag and were one of the features that allowed it to fly on a single engine. Underneath the wing's trailing edge, which you can't really see here, but you can on this landing footage, are split flaps, which work to increase lift at low speed, which was important when landing on rough, poorly maintained airports in regional areas. Now, I should credit the DC-1 as the first airliner to have these two features, although they only made one of those, so I'll kind of credit Douglas generally for these advances. The next new feature were the more efficient swept wing design rather than the straight wings of the Boeing 247 and other aircraft of that era. Engine options included the 9-cylinder Wright Cyclone 9 or the 14-cylinder Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp and the variable pitch propellers was one of the features that gave it the great engine performance which convinced TWA that they wouldn't need three engines. Now this actual aircraft in front of you was built over 80 years ago in 1941 and was the military variant, the C-47. In 1945, it was converted to the passenger DC-3, and by the way, DC stands for Douglas Commercial. In 1946, it was transferred to Trans-Australian Airlines, or TAA, and named Horden and flew the inaugural Melbourne to Sydney flight for this airline, so it really plays a special part in Australian aviation history. You'll see the Royal Mail markings on this aircraft, and while it did carry mail, the DC-3 was the first airliner that was actually profitable, with just passengers, and didn't require mail subsidies to operate. It was a hit with passengers, as it was quieter, heated, and faster. In fact, you could cross the United States in only 15 hours with three fuel stops, which was incredible for the time. This really was a stage when flying started to become somewhat glamorous. One of the major advances with the upgrade from the DC-2 to DC-3 was the introduction of a circular fuselage, and you'll notice this when I zoom in a little. It was more aerodynamic, but importantly, it was strong as the round shape distributes forces evenly, with no obvious failure points and hard corners. As the designers of the Comet discovered, circles are very strong and circular fuselages and windows have continued to this day in pressurized aircraft. Now before we go inside, let's quickly check out all these bits and bobs underneath the aircraft. Under this are the two pitot tubes measuring airspeed, and there's two in case one fails. There's a small DME antenna, which is the radio navigation system that gives you a distance between the plane and ground stations, which are littered all across the world. Behind that are these two rectangular holes where the two batteries would sit and could be easily replaced. The red and white mast and the wire extending behind it and this big black blob are the ADF, the Automatic Direction Finder. This would detect and display the bearing towards the ground station, which itself would be emitting radio waves, that they were heading to, as you have to remember that this flew before the era of GPS. 
This white thing is a weather mapping system and this mast with attached wire is the other half of the ADF antenna. And this thing is another antenna for the navigation system. It came with large wheels which were ideal for rough rural runways and the forward landing gear retracts although you can usually still see the lower part of them. At the back is a single wheel in a tail dragging configuration. There is no directional control over the wheels so you turn by modulating the throttle and or braking certain wheels. And on top all of these antennas and wires are for communication and navigation. Now let's head inside but quickly on the right here is a small cargo space. In the DC-3 you'll see the single thin door while the military C-47 had a much wider door as you can see in this one. Immediately on the right you've got the galley and toilet. Heading up the aisle which really is quite a noticeable incline you'll notice that there's a lot of legroom although remember that flying was incredibly expensive so that only travel class was first class. So while there's a lot less room these days, tickets are way cheaper. You'll notice the window is square and this wasn't a problem because the DC-3 wasn't pressurised like the Comet, so they weren't exposed to the dramatic changes in pressure and stress. On the left was the luggage storage area and a navigator would sit here in the C-47s and on the other side is the radio communication and navigation equipment. Back to the left is this small door where they would load the luggage and it could be used as an emergency exit. Then crossing back to the other side you've got the hydraulic systems. Entering the flight deck you've got the flap controls and below that is the retractable undercarriage. In the centre you've got the fire controls so there's the fuel cutoff and then the extinguisher bottle release. To the left of that is the landing gear down lock and a big red lever can be pumped if you lose hydraulic pressure although you'd get exhausted pretty fast. This lever on the left builds up the fuel pressure so the FO would be pumping away at this during the engine startup process. Up above the first officer's seat is the radio communication and forward to that you've got these amp meters for the power generators. The yellow warning light is for the cabin heating which comes from the engine. If the spill valve is closed this system will overheat when the engine is running hard such as takeoff. You've got the two engine fire warnings and the starter for the engines. The black panel above that is the old communication systems. And moving down to the first officer's view. On the right is the hydraulic pressure gauges and in front are the fuel and oil pressure gauges. There's also airspeed and altimeter hidden on the right and the air and oil temperatures. Below those are more modern radio communication systems and to the left are the fuel quantity gauges. Moving into the center you've got the two rev counters on the right and manifold pressures on the left for the two engines. The big black thing in the middle is the autopilot with the directional indicator on the left and the artificial horizon on the right. In the centre you've got these six different coloured levers for the two engines. You've got the propeller pitch controls, uh, T stands for throttle and on the right you've got the fuel mix. During takeoff and cruise you'll have a richer fuel mix, then in cruise it's in the middle and then cut off when you're closing the engine down. This red thing is the fuel tank selector and you can select any of the tanks to any of the engines and there's also one on the other side. There's the trim wheels for the rudder, elevator and aileron. The yellow star looking thing is for the autopilot and the red thing on the other side is the fuel cross feed system. So during startup you can cross feed the fuel to the other and in flight if there's a pump failure they can use the pressure from the other pump. And heading over to the captain's chair you've got a clock an airspeed indicator, rate of climb and altimeter. Moving across you've got the directional indicator, artificial horizon and the turn and bank indicator. Below is the indicator for the VOR bearings and the ILS. 
VOR, similar to ADF, allows the aircraft to determine its position and remain on course by receiving radio signals from fixed ground beacons. And ILS is the instrument landing system. And of course, here's the yoke. Up above the captain's head is the DME system, which I mentioned underneath the front of the aircraft. This stands for Distance Measuring Equipment and is another navigation system that measures the distance between the plane and a ground beacon. This can work in combination with VOR and ADF as well as a backup if one system fails. Above the captain are more buttons such as the lights, seatbelt sign and pitot heaters uh, so they don't freeze up. In the centre is the magneto switches to provide the electrical current for the spark plugs and moving back you'll see that above you is an escape hatch. And that's the end of this tour of a Douglas DC-3. In the end, 607 of them were built before World War II started, but over 10,000 of the military C-47s were built, and many were converted back to DC-3s, such as this very aircraft you're in. This as well as many other aircraft are on display at the Haas Aviation Museum at Albion Park, including a Super Constellation and a Boeing 747. If you're an av geek in Australia, this definitely should be added to your bucket list. Now don't forget to check out my channel for many more similar videos. Thanks for watching and I'll see you another time.